welcome to everybody welcome to everybody who's joining us here and welcome to everyone who's joining us online tonight we carry on with our series about the apostle paul and this is lesson number 20 so there's 19 other lessons that are already recorded and available to watch on our youtube channel and in tonight's lesson it's called the apostle paul sermon in jerusalem and so we have this mosaic picture that represents what Paul looked like. Uh, many books describe him with a big head, with a thin neck and a nasal speech and so on. So, so the images that are produced from the past of Paul all replicate that sort of teaching. In the Bible itself, it says that he is a person that's not of any significant appearance. Mm -hmm. So he's just a normal man and yet he had such a huge impact on the world. So just to introduce uh, this lesson from the previous lesson in Acts 21. So tonight we're going to be teaching from Acts 22. The Apostle Paul had arrived in Jerusalem and he met with many members of the early church on his return from his third mission trip. And his third mission trip, he had returned from Greece. He'd been to Macedonia and various areas of Greece. And he'd actually been collecting tithes to take back to Jerusalem, to the Church of Jerusalem. So he sees that church and honours it as the founding church of the faith. And he told them when he very first started, and they told him not to do this, but he told them that he was going to go out and he would collect money from the Gentiles and bring it back to support the Jews, or the Christian Jews, as we should probably say now, who were actually in the ancient land of Israel. And so we have this extraordinary thing where Paul's pretty pig-headed and it doesn't matter what he's told he's going to go ahead and do it anyway but he sees it as a great honor to support the church and so that's the message that comes behind it and you can imagine he's going out into these foreign countries where they used to worship all sorts of false gods and sacrifices and these people are now giving him money to take to a church in another land mm. and so you've got to imagine the impact that Paul actually had on all of these people so after arriving he was there for seven days and it's and the scriptures tell us that some jews from the province of asia minor okay so asia minor does anyone remember where asia minor is where turkey is where turkey is today that's right so i don't have a picture of this today i thought i did so well i'll reverse back to the screen um, <laughs> so Asia Minor is the eastern side of Turkey today so you've got the Dardanelles and you've got Constantinople on the uh, western European side as it's defined and on the eastern side all the way across to Syria and the top of Iraq etc that whole landmass is Turkey today and that was called Asia Minor back in the day so since Paul started his ministry there was people throughout this land where he went to preach who were determined to shut him down. They were Jews and they were angry that, that Paul was saying that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And so they didn't accept him. They refused to accept his preaching. And of course, they wanted to shut him down. Now we can point the finger at all that, but of course, Paul knows exactly what that was like. And he says so in his sermon tonight. Why? Because he was once that person himself. Mm, right. And so he completely understands it. So, when he came to the temple of Jerusalem, these people spotted him, found him, and they claimed that he was defiling the temple of Jerusalem by sneaking a Gentile into the outer court, or what was known as the court of the Gentiles. And once they go from there to the inner court, it's, def it's defined under Jewish law as a defilement of the temple. And so under their law, it's something that can't be permitted and they would normally be arrested. So they're obviously looking for a trumped up charge to bring Paul down. And they also talked about the fact that he was proclaimed to be teaching against the Jews. So you may recall as he goes through his ministry, everywhere he goes, he used to go to the synagogues first, to his own people. He would proclaim the message of Jesus and there'd be those who would believe and change their faith accordingly, but there was many who would never ever accept it. And so this is the course of his path and he was deemed by those who didn't want to accept it as teaching against his own belief. 
Now a riot ensued on the top of the temple as a result and Paul ended up being rescued from the angry mob by being arrested by the Roman guard. So right next to the Temple Mount in those days there was a Roman garrison with about 600 soldiers that were garrisoned there and they came out under the command of the Roman garrison commander and their focus was what? Do you think they were worried about Paul or who it was? No, the, crowd. the crowd. So what were they worried about? The fact that they would do what? Well they didn't run it. They didn't want to run it. They didn't want to riot, they didn't want an angry mob, mm. and so they wanted to shut them down before it went any further. Mm. So, so Paul was rescued, and we use these words rescued because they were going to kill him, mm. and by being arrested, it actually saved his life in that moment. Mm. It also means that the Roman law was being pitted against the Jewish laws in that moment. But of course the laws of the land at that time mm. were ruled by the Romans, not by the Jews. Mm. But when Paul asks the Roman commander, after they carry him out of there, he's chained to two other people, and they drag him out of there, and then he turns around and he speaks to the Roman commander, and the Roman commander realises he's an educated man, he can speak not just one language, but multiple languages, and of course the two that is talked about in the Bible are Aramaic and, and Greek. And so Paul comes from Tarsus and Cilicia, right on the top corner of the Mediterranean which was a Greek background at that point in time and the local the lingua franca of the region was also Greek because all the trading language but people spoke Aramaic predominantly in the land of Israel and that's the legacy of Aram Damascus which is where uh, Syria is today and the influence of the language in the region when they rule prior to the Greeks so these languages remained um, so when the Roman commander realised he was eloquent of speech and an educated man, he said that he could address this crowd, this angry mob. And so he received the commander's permission, and this leads us into Acts 22, which we're going to be reading tonight and exploring. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Acts 22, and we're first going to have a look at verses 1 to 2. And we're going to hear how Paul begins to address this angry mob. So again, that's Acts 22, verses 1 to 2. And he simply addresses it by saying, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defence. You may notice there's an absence of female gender in this. Why? Because the angry mob are made up of men. Why? It's because of where they were on the Temple Mount. No women were actually allowed. And so that's why he addresses only men. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defence. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, here's that mention of that language, they became very quiet. So if he was deemed a foreigner from Asian Minor, what language would they expect him to speak? Coin Greek. Coin Greek, that's right, the lingua franca. But he speaks to them in Aramaic, which is their local dialect, and they're, suddenly they're like, oh, we were told that he was a foreigner, a person associated with the Gentiles, but he's speaking our language. We better listen to this bloke. So they become very quiet. So when this opening address happens of brothers and fathers here, Paul is basically beginning his great defence. He's on trial. He's in front of all these people before the Jews the same way that Stephen did. So if you do flick to Acts chapter 7 verse 2, Stephen, when he addressed the crowd, of whom Paul was standing in the background as one of them, he actually opened up and said, brothers and fathers, listen to me. Mm. So in other words, he was addressing whom he saw as his own people as well. So Paul sets up this magnificent defence, and he actually uses the word defence itself. So in other words, he's actually telling them that he's going to defend his position. Mm. So in Greek, the word defence is actually apologia. An apologia in our language of English is what we call an apology today. And so this is where the word comes from. So when you read this in the scripture, listen now to my defense. It's like him saying, listen now to my apology. In other words, you've misunderstood me. I'm apologizing to you. Let me explain myself. So it refers to a formal defense of his 
past life and actions. In other words, he's going to explain how he arrived in this situation and why they're chasing him. Then it says that they became very quiet. So, of course, when they heard this language of Aramaic, they became quiet and they were ready to listen. So we're now going to go and read verse 3 of Acts 22. And in verse 3, Paul explains his Jewish upbringing and background to this volatile crowd who are standing in front of him. And it reads, Then Paul said, and he makes this declaration, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Why is he brought up in this city? He goes on to explain why. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. So Paul is speaking as a Jew to Jews. Mm. He's identifying with them. He's laying common ground between himself and them to say, I am no different to you. I wasn't brought up any different to you, and I don't believe anything different to you. So with this, Paul begins to tell the story of his life before Jesus Christ, and then he goes on to his conversion. So this was spoken about also in Acts 9, about Paul's conversion, which uh, we've read earlier on. But after this, Paul tells the story in the same way at least four more times in the New Testament. And so if you want to take notice of these, in Acts 22 that we're reading now, he speaks of the story to persuade the Jews. In Acts 26, which we're yet to come to, he tells the story to persuade the Gentiles, because he's obviously not in Jerusalem anymore. Bit of a giveaway, obviously he's going to make it out of here. And in Philippians 3, he tells the story for a theological understanding. And in 1 Timothy 1, he tells the story to give encouragement. So this is a repeated thing that he talks about. Now when he says that he's born in Tarsus, Cilicia, but brought in, up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, Paul is noting that he was in fact born outside of the promised land, which is why he's actually getting picked up by these people in the first place. They're saying you're a foreigner and you don't belong here. So he's acknowledging that yes, he wasn't actually born there. But in the same time, he comes back and he says that he actually studied under the most prestigious rabbi at the time. And we read about that in Acts 5, verse 34. And this, of course, is Gamaliel. And, of course, this tells us how Paul came to be in Jerusalem in the first place. Okay, so it's all revealed in the book of Acts. Now, he says that he's trained in the law of his ancestors and zealous toward God. So as Paul stated in another place, in Philippians 3, verse 5, I don't know if any of you have taken notice of this, but he says that he is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Yeah. Like he's saying he's the king of the kings. He's the Hebrew of the Hebrews. And then he goes on to say, concerning the law, a Pharisee. So he declares that he's a Pharisee. So they know that then that he's a teacher of the law. They know that he's probably a very serious man as a Pharisee because of the, the role they played in society. And he also states his social status because Pharisees came from a, gen, a, a group of people who were not wealthy. They were, in fact, from uh, representing the poor people. Mm -hmm. And so he tells them a lot through this. So to the smallest detail, Paul keeps the law as understood by the people of his day. Now he goes on to say that he's zealous toward God the same as they all are today. So he's saying to them, you're all rioting and want to kill me. I understand that because I was like that too. And you're doing this because you're zealous, zealous and passionate about God. And so this is about the nicest thing he can think to say to the mob to make sure that they don't try and murder him. So that's what he's trying to, to get out of. Okay, so let's now go to verses 4 to 5 of Acts 22. And in this, Paul tells how he persecuted the Christians. So first, so first of all, he's established that he's a Jewish man. And then now he's going to morph across and tell them that as a Jew, he too persecuted Christians. So he's aligning with them. And it reads, I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. So he's telling them that he too was a, a zealous and fierce person, as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. 
I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. And so this is the beginning, obviously, of Paul's journey when he met our Lord Jesus Christ. So this was evidence of the zeal that's mentioned in the previous line that we just read. Paul was so energetic as a persecutor that in some cases he's actually declaring that he's actually responsible for the death of followers of Jesus. And so if you look at a person's character and you think, my goodness me, the impact this man's had on the world for Jesus, and yet he was killing people for Jesus in his earlier days. What does that say about the message of forgiveness? What does that say about who the Lord you? Who the Lord uses? Do you have to be a perfect person no. for the Lord to use you? Well, clearly not. They took this guy who was actually on a mission to go and persecute Christians and that Jesus revealed himself to him. Yeah. So he revealed himself to him because of the sort of person and passion that he had, mm. not because of what he had done. Yeah, and right. so this is what's important. Mm. So Paul communicated to the crowd, basically saying, you tried to kill me, but hey, I actually succeeded in killing a few myself. In other words, I am like you. So this is what he's saying. So this was probably fairly surprising news to this crowd because they've all been told that he's a foreigner and he's bringing Gentiles onto the Temple Mount and that he's defiling and disagreeing with everything that they believe. And clearly this is not the case. It goes on to say, The high priest bears him witness and all the council of the elders from whom I received letters. So Paul did his work of persecution with the official approval of the religious leaders who, of course, are all functioning from the temple of Jerusalem itself where they're persecuting him. He then says he went to Damascus to bring in chains those who were there. So he was energetic enough to carry on his campaign of persecution outside of where he was living, which was Jerusalem. He was out to go out beyond Judea into Syria and straight to the city of Damascus. So the message is clear. He's basically saying, I understand why you attack me. I was once an attacker also. I understand where you are coming from. So at this point in time, we've been tracking Paul and his ministry. He's done three mission trips, but he's been a Christian now for over 20 years at this point in time. And he can still to relate, relate to those who are not, because obviously he was born, brought up the same as them. Okay, let's go to look at verses 6 to 11 next. Paul describes here his, what we have to call supernatural experience on the way to Damascus. Clearly there's nothing normal about what happens here. He says, About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. You get the picture he's telling a sermon now? Mm -hmm. right? he's, he, he's recasting everything through mm -hmm. this journey because he's got a message to tell the people. And so he's recounting all of this mm -hmm. stuff. So he says, Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. Mm. And so he declares to all these people that he went as a person like them and then he encountered an experience with Jesus whom they persecute followers of mm -hmm. and there was a consequence for, the, for what he did that he was blinded on the road and Jesus declared that he had a purpose for his life for him. So this great light from heaven, it says, shone around him and so of course this heavenly light that shone on him is a what? Do we read about this elsewhere in the Bible? So when Jesus went up to the top of the mount and he spoke to whom? Anyone remember? One prophet, one leader? Moses. Moses was one, very Aaron. good. And who? Aaron. No, not Aaron. Oh, um, prophet. Yeah, another prophet. Uh, Samuel, was it? No. 
lives on a place called Mount Carmel. One with farm over. <laughs> His name's Elijah. Elijah. Yeah, Elijah. And it said that when he went up onto oh, the mountain, he was emitting this glow that was so bright and white that nobody could look at him. And so we have this experience repeated throughout the Bible. Mm. And so this white light is a symbol of what? The light. Glory of God. Glory of God. Purity, Purity. holiness. <coughs> white represents clean, nice. being clean and holy. And so untainted by sin. And so in this point, Paul, when he meets him, is tainted with sin. And he encounters holy, pure mm. righteousness in the light. And of course, who is the light? God. Mm, who is Jesus? Jesus. God, um. our Saviour, yeah. as it means. Okay. So he encounters Jesus. And it's, so Paul's literally saying, I've had an encounter with Jesus. I'm just like you all. But Jesus met me and my life was dramatically changed as a consequence. Mm. He then goes on to say that Jesus said to him, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now this is a really profound statement, of course, because by this time, Jesus is no longer alive and walking on the earth. As far as the people are concerned, he's not a person of the mm. flesh anymore. And so Paul had to come to understand that he was persecuting Jesus himself, this shining Lord of glory, and he didn't really know who he was persecuting until this. So in other words, Jesus is saying, when you persecute my people, you're persecuting me as if you're doing it personally to me. And so clearly he's going after these people who believe in Jesus, but he clearly doesn't know who Jesus is himself. He doesn't have any personal knowledge of him. Mm. Quite amazing, isn't it? Because people hear people believing other things and go after them and yet they have no personal revelation of what they're going after or why mm. but they'll still go after them yes. and so was the case with Paul and so is the case with this crowd of people now this brightness of the light made Paul blind and so what do you think the significance of Paul becoming blind was we're going past tense here he had to trust God he had to trust God <laughs> yeah God demonstrate you know back to right his take it from him right punishment. took something from his power his so maybe his sovereignty <coughs> to humble him to humble him anything well, else <laughs> well he showed what is him blind he, take, he, he showed him that he could take it away right he couldn't see so what was he doing he was this actually so you're all giving me fleshly answers is this actually about the flesh or is this about something else no, it's about the spirit right so when he was blinded mm. what's the significance he was shown to be spiritually blind blind he took his sight away mm. and when he took <laughs> his sight away he didn't know who he was anymore yeah remember he spoke about this he lost himself he didn't just lose his sight he didn't know who he was anymore or what he believed because suddenly there was something greater mm. that had come along and he became spiritually blind in a physical sense. Mm. So in other words, he had been spiritually blind to Jesus prior to this and then when Jesus blinded him, he's now blind in a physical sense. And of course, he's blinded in a physical sense and of course, what does he do? He starts searching spiritually for an answer mm. for why this happened to him. So he was at this point in time, he was both spiritually blind and now he's physically blind as well. Mm. So in other words, the scriptures tell us that he had to be humbly led by the hand of another man into the city of Damascus. Basically, he has no more powers. Mm. He has no more means to persecute. It was taken away from him in an instant. Okay, let's go on to verses 12 to 16. In verses 12 to 16, Paul goes on to describe his response to this supernatural experience that he's had on the way to Damascus. So he says, A man called Ananias came to see me. He was a devout, and this is what's interesting here. He was a devout observer of the law. In other words, he's saying, He was like me and he was like you, and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. 
Then he said, the God of our ancestors, so he's saying he's a bloodline descendant like him, mm. has chosen you to know his will. And then he says, and to see the righteous one, which is whom? Yes. Jesus. And to hear words from his mouth. Mm. So you will be a witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. So in other words, there's the purpose in why this happened. And now what are you waiting for? <laughs> it's like, no time like the present. Get up, be baptised and wash your sins away. Calling on his name. Calling on the name of Jesus. Nice. So he's not saying I'm taking your identity away. He's saying you are a descendant. You are a Jewish person just like those who are around him. But he now has a new identity in Christ and he has a new purpose more, more so for Christ. And this is the significant change. So Paul noted here, he says the name, that it was Ananias, a man who was credentialed with being a good Jew. And so this is part of the significance. Others would have known him who received him into what was a Christian family. So the God of our ancestors has chosen Paul so that he could know his will. So in Paul's speech, we see that both he and Ananias both simply acted like good Jews. They don't differentiate who they are in the terms of their identity. And they do not resist God nor deny the heritage. So they're basically saying that the change in them is a consequence of God, whom they believe in as a Jewish person, not as a consequence of being anything else. Mm. And so they're saying, I'm a Jew who is commanded by God to recognize Jesus, see him as righteous, mm. and to follow him and to do his work. So Paul wanted them to know that he still serves the same God. In other words, it's not a different God. Yeah. And this is one of the proclamations about Christianity. You know, when you say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's like, oh, well, there's more than one God, right? And so he's saying, no, that's not the case. Mm. So he's saying that he's still serving the same God of Israel as his fathers did. He had not rejected Judaism, in other words. In fact, what does he do every time he goes back to Jerusalem? He goes to the temple, he makes his sacrifices, mm. he still follows the, follows the ordinances wow. that were given to him in the Old Covenant. Yeah. So he had not rejected Judaism at all. Instead, what he's saying is that Judaism has rejected God, who is revealed through Christ Jesus. Mm. So he's saying the failing is on them, not on, on himself in this instance. So the God of his ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth, it says in verse 14. So this is a wonderful capsule of the duty of everyone before God. Again, it says he's chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear words from his mouth. Mm. So, what's your duty before God? If you're ever wondering what do you have to, what do you have to do to be dutiful to God, you have to know his will. You have to see the righteous one, talking about Jesus, mm. and you have to hear the words from his mouth. That's what you all have to do. Mm. So there's a recognition and acceptance that Jesus is your Lord and Saviour. And he is righteous. In other words, he is, what does righteousness mean or righteous mean? To be right with God. No, no, more than that, what does righteousness mean? It means he is without. Without blemish. Right. Without Sin and righteousness are the two opposite ends. Mm. Okay, if you're righteous, you're without sin. Mm. If you're sin, you're not righteous. Right. One or the other. So when he calls Jesus the righteous one, he calls him the man or the son of God mm. who is without sin. Right. So, and of course, the voice of the mouth. And I was listen to what he has to say. All right. Verses 17 to 18 next in Acts 22. In Acts 22, uh, in this portion... Jesus speaks to Paul in a trance, the scripture says, or Paul says in the scripture, at the temple in Jerusalem. So it reads, When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking to me. 
Quick, he said, leave Jerusalem immediately because the people here will not accept your testimony about me. What does that say? We, remember, we were talking about this in the previous lesson. What happened when he was on his way back on the third mission trip? What was he being told? What happened when he met Don't with the Ephesians? To, um, Don't go back. Yeah. And I was, he went back anyway. He knew what his destiny was to be. Uh, yeah. But everyone's warning him, don't go back, don't go back. Because they know also what his destiny is going to be. Uh, and yet he still goes. And the Lord's there saying to him, leave Jerusalem immediately now. Why do you think the Lord's saying to leave Jerusalem immediately? Because he knew what was going to happen to him. Right. But what does that say? What do you think that says? Think about when Je Jesus was on his journey. Wasn't there times when Jesus was being persecuted where they quick, hurry, hurry, quick, get out the back door. Mm. Got to get away before they get you. Why was that? Well, uh, if he was taken out early, then he wouldn't, wouldn't have been going to write on that Right, he wouldn't have fulfilled God's plan. Yeah. And so when Paul's been told by the Lord, quick, get out, it's like, this is not your time, mate. Yeah. Mm. This is not where it's going to happen. This is not how it's going to happen. Right. So don't go there. You don't actually need to go there. Yeah. Paul's going, yeah, I'm going. <laughs> so, so you've got to think about that context. So when he returns to Jerusalem, praying at the temple, Paul is telling him something that's happened to him now 20 years before. And, and when he had been a follower of Jesus for two or three years. Now even though he'd been a Christian for a few years, yet he still came to Jerusalem to pray in the temple because he wants the crowd to know that even though he trusts in Jesus, he's not against Jewish practice. Mm. He's not against the Jewish ordinances, the laws, the creeds, the sacrifices, the tithes. Mm. He is still a Jewish man. He's still bound by the old covenant. And this is the whole story, and this is the big battle in the New Testament. That we talk about you know, how does a person go forward as a Christian person do they have to observe the laws and we've come to the conclusion and the Bible tells us this that a Jewish person can become a follower of Jesus but that doesn't mean that they're not a Jew mm -hmm. and so they will practice so a Messianic Jew today will practice the same as his Jewish forefathers but if you're a Gentile that doesn't mean you're required to do the same you're not bound by the old covenant and the old laws mm. and so our walk should be different from a Jewish person mm. and so today in society we have Jewish messianic teaching mm. creeping into the church and people practicing elements of it but is that correct no it's not it's not required but is it right for them yes yeah. it's okay we should be able to walk side by side we believe in the same Lord but it means that the way we go through our journey is different to one another. Mm. Okay, so good to be clear on that because a lot of people get messed up over this stuff. It says that Paul falls into a trance and he saw Jesus speaking to him. So Paul has, obviously has an impressive vision of Jesus while he's in the temple. But he doesn't refer to this vision in any of his letters. And he seems only to mention it now in front of the riot because I think he believes it's a necessity. He's in an extreme situation and he's got to explain himself. So Paul's Christian life is obviously founded on God's truth, not spiritual experiences, and he didn't even like to talk a lot about his spiritual experiences. In fact, Paul speaks about himself very, very little. Everything that we read in the Bible is pretty much him teaching about God and about how people should be living their lives, how the church should form, what they should be doing, etc. Mm. But there's a couple of instances, and this is one where he reveals his own heart and his own journey because he needs to in this instance. So Paul's told to make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, and the reason for this is because the Jews will actually not receive his testimony concerning Jesus. So from Jesus' point of view, when he's saying, get out and go it's because he's basically saying well you're wasting your time no one's listening anyway mm -hmm. so there's no point in being there so this was probably a bit of a surprise to Paul you know it came to him when he's there at the mount and with good reason because he probably thought of himself as the right person the perfect person to give the gospel to his fellow Jews so he's chained up he's with the Romans they all want to kill him and he goes what a perfect opportunity to speak yeah. about the Lord 
yeah. <laughs> how would you go in that situation? <laughs> you might think, I'm alive, I'll just hide in the back corner for a while until they all go. Not Paul. He's going, yeah, 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 let's go. And he gets stuck back into them all again. And so this is says something about his character. So Jesus gives him the warning nevertheless, and he actually tells him to go quickly, to make haste, right? because he knows it's not going to end well if he hangs around. Okay, let's now go to verses 19 to 20. And in 19 to 20, Paul answers Jesus. So, of course, he's heard this message from Jesus, and now Paul is answering him. He says, Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue, and we mentioned this before, to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr, Stephen, was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. So he declares his role in Stephen's death. So this is something that we hear about very strongly and he declares it to the Jewish people. Mm. So first in this component of scripture he says that they know that in every synagogue that he was teaching and he was imprisoned as a consequence. There was many times he was caught, he was sometimes taken out of town to be beaten, to be left for dead, and other times he wasn't, but at the end of the day he was still prepared to do it. So this is Paul's gentle objection to the warning that Jesus just gave him in the vision. Paul's idea is, Lord, they'll listen to me. They know I used to persecute Christians, so my story will be more powerful and persuasive to them. So in other words, they're going to identify with his message. Often when people give testimonies, that's how it works, isn't it? I was once a sinner. This is what happened to me. Look how I've changed. You're in the same boat. You can change too. And so this is what Paul's saying to these people. And he talks about the blood of the martyr Stephen, and he confesses that he was standing by and holding the clothes of those who were stoning him to death. So Paul thinks that his early and energetic persecution of the church gives him more credibility amongst these people um, who are actually against Christians, about against followers of Jesus. He tries to explain to Jesus why he should stay in Jerusalem and work to tell the Jewish people about him. And so Paul's faith is obviously very, very strong, so strong, he's literally willing to defy the Lord himself when he gives him a message. He thinks he can make a difference. What that speaks to me is it says that he has an incredible passion for his faith mm. and so, so passionate he's willing to almost defy the very thing that he believes in itself. But and this uh, for his people. Right. Because really, he probably thought, well, why would I go to the Gentiles? I want to speak to my people. Right. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Very, very strong. Okay, so let's now look at verse 21. In verse 21, Jesus replies to this response of Paul. He says, Then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. What do you think that's about? He's just declared that he's here in Jerusalem. He thinks he's got a shot at speaking to the Jews. Jesus is saying, no, you're wasting your time. And he says, I'll send you far away to the Gentiles. What was Paul called to do in the first place by Jesus? To kill the Christians. No, no, no. In the first place? No, when Jesus called him, what did oh, he call sorry. him to do? He called him to... Go out and, and the the preach the gospel to oh. the Gentiles. Oh. Gentiles yeah. So here, when you read this, he says, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. In other words, hop it, get out of here. This is not your job. This, this role is for somebody else. He has other people in Jerusalem. The church is there. He said, your job is to go out to the Gentiles. He's also pointing the, the future for Paul. Mm. because he knows what Paul's pathway is, he knows how his life's going to finish, and he's saying here, I'm going to send you far away, so in other words, where he's going to actually meet his end <laughs> is a long way from Jerusalem, of course, everyone knows where it is. Mm. It's in Rome. Rome itself, that's right. So he doesn't want him dying <laughs> in no. Jerusalem, and so he pushes him along and says, away. off you go. 
So Jesus obviously doesn't agree with Paul's response. Mm -hmm. And Jesus knows that it's not Paul's time, as I've just said. And he also is saying it's not his place to preach to the Jewish people the way that Paul wants to. Mm -hmm. Because Paul's position in terms of what he's preaching is to the Gentiles. And the Jewish people know how he preached to the Gentiles. We followed this journey and he brings people with him who are Gentiles and they don't follow God's old covenant laws and yet they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we see in this that Paul's purpose and how Paul speaks and whom he speaks to is different to what's going to happen in the Holy Land. Mm. So for his safety, Jesus told him 20 years earlier to go from Jerusalem, go away. But Paul, of course, keeps going back. So what does this tell you? <laughs> what does this tell you about people? Stop. All right. And even <laughs> when Jesus is... Ma- Can you imagine Jesus speaking to you directly? <laughs> yeah. He goes, all right, I want you to go. Oh, yeah, but, you know... Can I just come back? So he's being disobedient yes. but he's being disobedient out of passion, passion. so Jesus must be there going oh, this guy's just <laughs> <in the neck." laughs> what am I going to do with him he won't obey anything I tell him I love him but you know he needs a good yeah. kick up the backside but the point is is that he started his ministry and he told him 20 years ago and here he's 20 years later saying just do what I said 20 years ago will you <laughs> and so, and so it tells you that Paul hasn't changed very much in terms of his character <laughs> So when Paul was touched by the Lord in Damascus, he was told then, so this is in Acts 9 verse 15, just to sow into this, he was told then to preach to the Gentiles, Mm. straight up, preach to the Gentiles. So the words from Jesus to him in the temple of Jerusalem are not new. They're old words as far as Paul's concerned. Mm. Now we can see that in his first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion, it would have been easy for Paul to care so much for the conversion of Israel that he would want to concentrate on that. That's why Jesus gave him the reminder in the temple. So what does that tell all of us about our walk as Christian people today? Do you expect that you're all going to walk on exactly the same path? Do you think that when you come in and gather as the saints to receive teaching and to worship him, etc., as we do in church, does that mean that you do everything together and don't go out don't mix with society. No, no it's completely the opposite, isn't it? And that's one of the, th- the failings, I think, of the modern church. Yeah. So busy trying to build the big walls and pull large people in and having events, you know, forming groups. Everybody play tennis together. Everybody do this together. Mm. And nobody's mixing in society anymore. Yeah. So in other words, they're all wasted. <clears throat> they're not actually fulfilling any purpose. Yes. And so they should be listening to the Lord. And that's why I often say to people, do you actually know what your purpose is? Mm. You know, we're not talking about your occupation. Mm. We're talking about what your, pers- your purpose is in Christ. And I think this is the challenge. Mm. It's like a building and sharpening up in here. Yeah. And then you go out there and you, you're sort of more equipped. Because yes. You've done it in here with your brothers and sisters. Right. It's an equipping. You know, and then you're, you're more... That's exactly <coughs> right. It's an equipping, isn't it? Yeah. It's a preparing. It's a teaching. It's a gaining of wisdom. It's a gaining of knowledge. It's being supported. It's mm-hmm. about being sowing in. But at the end of the day, it's to go out. Right. You know, when you're coming in, you're a disciple. You know, once you've been a disciple, Jesus tells you to become an apostle and to go out. Mm-hmm. There's no purpose in learning anything in life if you're not going to use it for any purpose. That's right. So this is what he's calling him to do. So we can see also from his first visit. So he gives him this reminder. So Paul makes it clear that it wasn't his idea to preach to the Gentiles. In other words, he's saying that this is, to, he's talking to the people, remember, in all of this. So all those people out there in front of him, he's basically saying, this is not my idea. I did it because the Lord called me to do it. I'm still a Jewish person like you, mm. but I'm doing what God tells me to do. And unfortunately, he's showing his disobedience in his personal dialogue but in front of them, he feels that he's doing the right thing. So he's hoping through this that explains to the crowd why he, why he seems so friendly to the Gentiles. And it's because Paul's simply obeying Jesus and his word to him. 
you have to remember that Jewish law says you can't go into a Gentile's house. Mm. You cannot eat at the same table together. There's all these prohibitive laws. And so Paul going and talking to them and going into their homes. Mm. Remember everywhere he went, he went to the synagogues. Mm. He would speak to the Jews first and then he would speak to the Gentiles, get invited into their homes and he would go and eat with them. Mm. And as a consequence, he's seen as defiling the Jewish beliefs with the Lord's covenant laws. Okay, so let's um, read verse 22 to 23 now of Acts 22. And in these verses, the crowd riots in response to Paul's message. So in other words, they went quiet in the beginning and he was identifying himself as one of them. Now he speaks about uh, Jesus and about doing the Lord's work and the crowds start to get upset again. So it says here, the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him, he's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air. So you can sort of picture that they're getting physically rowdy, they're yelling at the same time, and so it must have been quite a scene in front of them. So the crowd that had tried to kill Paul for a period of time had listened intently to him. And so, in other words, they received his sermon. Whether they accepted it or not is another thing, but they received his message. In other words, in that huge crowd on the Temple Mount, mm. he preached the message of the Lord Jesus to them all. Jesus himself said, you're wasting your time. Mm. Go away. But Paul feels like he's accomplished something because in that moment, he stood before the crowd. Mm. So, of course, this erupts into a rage, and the rage happens over these words and the, and the main word that erupts over is the word Gentiles because they find it offensive in every way. So this Jewish mob was outraged at the thought that God's salvation could be given freely to Gentile people and this is the underlying issue the whole time. So the mob had listened carefully they almost didn't mind his talk about Jesus. In other words, they listened to him about what he'd said about the Lord Jesus. But as soon as he talked about God saving Gentiles, mm -hmm. they erupted. And so they get upset again. And so what do you think the message is in that? Like we're reading this, you might be listening to it like a story. But what's, it, what's the message of this? What do you think all of that is saying to us? What do you have to be to come before God? Humble and obedient. Humble and obedient? Mm. What, are the, yeah. what are the Jews saying you have to be to come before God? Just a Jew. Jewish. Right. Ah. Just all Jewish. People. Full stop. Yeah. Bloodline descendant of Abraham. Mm. That's it. No one else. It's pretty funny, isn't it? Because... Mm. I recall that Abraham was called out of the city of Ur. He was worshipping false gods. And yet their bloodline descendants of him, he was called out by God, but Abraham too was a sinner. And he too worshipped other things. And yet suddenly they're holier than thou. The Lord tells them to go out and preach to the Gentiles, which is the very person that Abraham once was. Remember what the word Hebrew means. It means from the other side. So in other words, he came from the other side of the Euphrates River. Right. He wasn't circumcised till he was and he was, That's right. Yeah. yeah. He was actually circumcised at the same time as Ishmael was circumcised when he was 13. Mm. And so it was a long, long time. So the message that Paul is giving you here and the message that we're receiving from the New Testament from the book of Acts that we're actually reading is that whether... You are Jew, you are Gentile, you're a foreigner, you're a local, you're high in society, low in society, you're rich, you're poor, you're big, you're small, whatever you are, mm. at the end of the day, you can come to God just as you are, mm. but you must come to him through Jesus, Jesus Christ. Oh That's it. There's no physical, there's no bloodline descendancy mm. that will give you an opportunity to be saved unless you come through Jesus. That's it. And what does Jesus tell us in his parables? Come he talks about 
come as you are, but he says that the gate is narrow, narrow and the only way that you can get through is by him. And remember the parable? He's there, he's at the sheep pen, and in those days the shepherds would sleep across the entrance to the sheep pen so that nothing could pass in to get the sheep and none of the sheep could get out because he was taking care of them. And so he said, nothing gets in but by me. And he says the gate is small, and it's on purpose because it's to protect his people. But it also tells you that there's a limit to how many can actually get through. Okay, so the answer to this is there's no such thing as religion for it in its own right. There's only one way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. So these Jews of the day don't actually have a problem. This is the interesting thing when you think about all this. They don't actually have a problem with Gentiles becoming Jews. If you read your Old Testament scripture, and if you read Isaiah, in fact, if you go to the Temple Mount today and you read the scripture that's on the wall, it actually tells you about how all people from all nations are welcome and how aliens, not not outer space ones, (laughs) but people who are not Jewish people, were welcome into their society. And we read in the Old Testament times when people from other societies would actually join them and would become as one with them. Where's a great example? A huge example in the Bible of this. Who's an alien who becomes a Jew? Um, uh, Boaz's wife, Ruth. Very good, Ruth, (laughs) exactly. Ruth was from where? Uh, Moab. Moab. Right, she was a Moabite. Moabite. And she didn't want to go back home to her family when the when the husbands died. Why? Because she would have had to go back to worshipping false gods, the sacrifices and everything that went with that. Mm. So she went and she said, I am one of you. So she lived her life as a Jew. She was accepted as a Jew. And mm. she was accepted as a mother of the next generation of a forefather of Jesus. Right. And so that's not the issue. It's not about being a Gentile. A Gentile can become a Jew. So the Jews don't have a problem with that. So what do they have a problem with here? It's not about the Gentiles. It's about the Gentiles becoming Christians. Why have they got such a problem with that? Because they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. No, the Jews are completely bypassed. They're not even in the picture. Not even there. Well, because then, then they're not using their traditional... Um, um, right they don't have to observe and that was the whole point of all the arguing in the Bible Mm. so the problem is is that they're offended at the thought of Gentiles becoming Christians just as Jews became Christians there was no difference to them they're offended at the idea that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and so it doesn't matter who, who you are what nation you come from Part of the problem for them in this is that it says that if everybody can come through Jesus to receive salvation, Mm. it implies that Jews and Gentiles are equal. Mm. In other words, the Jews are no longer set apart. Remember in the scripture, the the Bible says that the Jews were set aside as God's people. Abraham was pulled out of a world full Mm. of sin and God declared him as his own and from him a mighty nation would birth so many people that you wouldn't be able to count them Mm. but they were set apart they were god's people Mm -hmm. and so they become bloodline descendants Mm. so the jews cannot get their head around the idea that anybody else Mm. could have access to this and so it made them seem equal and that meant that they had to have god on the same terms so if they follow all of their religious practices and others don't, they're basically saying, how on earth can you be accepted by God the same way if God gave us his laws and we have to do all this and you don't? So, mm-hmm. oh. so this is the sort of bigger picture behind all of this. Then finally it says, rid the earth of him. So this is the people. They're saying, rid the earth of Paul. He's not fit to live. So they're outraged, and this is their violent response over the Gentiles. Now 
Now it's interesting in this to think about this. This Jewish mob that's in this example in the Bible, they express their hatred of others through violent rage. What's happening in Israel today in many nations? What do people do when they don't get their own way? They express violent rage. Mm. They kill people. And so these people in history did the same as any other human being. So it tells you the same message that all mankind's the same. It doesn't matter what you believe or where you're from. Others express their hatred of perishing through indifference, however. Uh, they don't do anything about it. So for us, we may not write like what the mob in the chapter do, but if we don't do anything, in other words, we're complacent, we way. fall into the same basket. And we've spoken about this before. Complacency is a sin when we don't do anything about it. Okay, so we're getting towards the end. So we're going to go to verse 24. And in this last section, we turn to Paul being in the custody of the Romans. And the commander is demanding an explanation of the right to Paul. And it says here, the commander ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks or the garrison, as it was called in those days. He directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. So it must have been strange for a Roman commander. He saw Paul, he asked him for permission, and then he saw him address passionately a huge crowd in a language that he didn't even know. He saw the crowd listening attentively, and then suddenly they erupt in riot again. So he must have been wondering what on earth is going on. But when it's explained to him, he must have thought that it's absurd and offensive. All this writing springing out of the hatred of Gentiles, and of course, what's he? He's a Gentile. And so he wouldn't uh, comprehend why this is happening. So from now on until the end of the book of Acts, Paul is actually in Roman custody. This is the point in the Bible where Paul remains in Roman custody. Mm. As far as this book, the book of Acts, is concerned, this is the end of the time when Paul is a free man from this point onwards. It's not the end of his witness or his usefulness to God, mm. but he is a no longer a free man. Now it talks that he's examined under flogging. If we look back at this correctly, we're talking about scourging, and this is exactly the same thing that the Romans did to Jesus. Mm. So when we look at Paul's pathway now and how he meets his end, he basically goes through a prolonged pathway that's the same as Jesus. Mm. He's beaten with a scourge, he's flogged. And so this is not a normal whip. This is reserved for the worst of the worst. And so Men, as you can imagine, often died or they were crippled for life after scourging. The Bible tells us when it happened to Jesus, if we read the prophets, mm. it talks about the fact that his ribs were exposed. And was it literally hooks and rips the flesh off. Also in Isaiah, it says that Jesus looked like a worm when they finished with him because in other words, he wasn't recognisable as a human. So that was the mess that they actually made of him. This is what's happening to Paul now. So he's not got away with anything. He's suffering. So this, of course, isn't normal Jewish flogging. This is the sort of flogging that was done by the Romans. The key here, though, is that the Romans, at this point in time, don't realise that Paul is a Roman citizen. Because under Roman law, it is not permitted to flog someone with a scourging whip. So in other words, this tells us that they don't know that Paul is a Roman citizen of this, at this time. So when the centurion hears this, he went to the commander and he, and he reports it. And he says, what are you going to do? And he asks, this man is a Roman citizen. So you can imagine the commander's now petrified. It says that they bound Paul with thongs. So Paul had his hands tied with leather straps. So his hands would have been joined around a wooden pole and his back was totally exposed exactly the same as what happened to Jesus. So he was going to get a brutal beating on the premise that he would confess whatever his crimes were. They didn't know what his crimes were. And when he spoke to the people and revealed 
what he believed and why they were writing, the Romans were incapable of understanding what he actually said. So it's at this point that Paul announces his Roman citizenship. And then they say, take care of what you do, for this man is a Roman. So when this becomes known, their reaction is immediate. It's a serious violation of Roman rights. They're not allowed to even be bound without a due process first, meaning they have to go through a court of law. And of course, being violated in this way is outside of their legal process. Okay, so let's now read verses 27 to 29. And in this portion, the commander questions Paul about his citizenship. Obviously, he's been made, he's been made aware of it. It says, the commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, so he asked a direct question now, are you a Roman citizen? You think he would have asked this question first, but he <laughs> gets his flogging in first. He says, yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship. So what does this tell you about the commander? He wasn't born a Roman citizen. Paul then replies, but I was born a citizen. So in other words, Paul's status in Roman society is actually elevated beyond the person, the, the commander. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realised that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains extraordinary, right? They just ripped his skin off and he's worried about putting him in chains. Yeah. But there you go. So the penalty for lying for a Roman citizenship is actually significant. So in other words, if Paul was lying about it and they find out, he's up for even worse. And so it's not something that you would lie about. When people declare something in those days, do you think they had a uh, document in their back pocket saying, look, here's my proof? No, most people were illiterate. And so their verbal claim was normally deemed enough. Penalties for falsifying any documents and false claims of citizenship would end up with these people dead. And so people didn't just freely say something like this. It would be checked out. Mm. And he says, with a large sum, the citizenship was obtained. Because of all the commotion the being that Paul had received, he probably obviously looked pretty terrible. The commander was wondering how someone who looked like this could purchase his citizenship. Mm. So in other words, he's making this assumption here. So in other words, they look at Roman citizenship as a privilege. You have to have wealth to be a Roman citizen. So if you see someone and they look really ordinary, the assumption is that they couldn't actually be a Roman citizen. They wouldn't be dressed like this, they wouldn't present like this. And so this is why they say, well, how on earth can Paul claim this? Because he doesn't appear to be a Roman by the way he's dressed. So Paul says, I was born a citizen, which means that either his parents or his grandparents must have been awarded the rights of a Roman citizen prior to him. So in other words, he's a generational citizen. We don't know how that happened. The Bible doesn't tell us about the citizenship or his parents, but usually citizenship would be granted to people who provided a valuable service to the Roman Empire. And so his father or his f- grandfather perhaps had worked hard or maybe he served, they served in the army or in the foreign legion or something like that in order to be rewarded. Mm. So Paul, in reality, was an extremely rare individual as a Roman citizen. Exactly. It was uncommon to find an educated, intelligent and yet devout Jew who was also a Roman citizen. Uh-huh. It doesn't go together. God uses this unique background to use Paul in a unique way. Mm -hmm. Even if he wants to use your unique background, you might think about your own background and think, well, how does God use that in the lives of other people? Because everybody has their own unique background. We're all born. We all have different parents. Most of us come from different places, but not here in this room. (laughs) We uh, we got. A lot of foreign Gentiles sitting around here, I tell you. (laughs) All right. So the commander says then, he's also, he's afraid after he found out that Paul was Roman because he had bound him. 
So knowing what he knew, now knew about Paul, the commander, he's concerned about Paul? No? No, he's concerned about himself. He's gone, whoops, I flogged this guy. I'm in trouble. Yes, yeah, right. Okay, so let's read the last verse, verse 30, for tonight's reading from chapter 22 of Acts. And it simply says, the Roman commander, sorry, beg your pardon, it describes that the Roman commander arranges a hearing of the charges against Paul. But who does he organise the hearing before? A Roman court? Sanhedrin. A Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. This smacks a bit of Jesus' story as well, doesn't it? So let's read this. The commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews. So in other words, that's the reason. That's what he wants to find out. So the next day he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the members of the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. So Paul wants to know for certain why he's accused, obviously, because he hasn't broken any Roman laws and the Roman wants to have him judged in a Jewish court. Why do you think he does that? Because he's just broken the laws as a Roman citizen. Mm. He's looking for a way out here. That's right. right. And so this is what we see happening in the time of Jesus as well. So the Roman can commander must have thought that once he had a concrete accusation, he could then justify the flogging that he's already given him after yeah. the fact. Right. So he the commanding of the chief priests and their council to appear and brought, Paul is brought before them. So Paul receives what he probably thought of as a dramatic second chance. The opportunity to preach to the mob on the Temple Mount ended in another riot, but now he's going to get to speak before the Sanhedrin as well. So he's been told, you can see why Jesus told him to get out of there. So of course the Sanhedrin is what? It's a Jewish council. Right, so it's a, you can call it a congress or a parliament for the Jewish people. It's their, it's their body of people that takes care and practices all the laws and ensures that people fulfil them all. So Paul's been given the opportunity to speak before the very group that he was once a member of. He was a Pharisee, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, yes. and so many of the people he's going to be brought before are going to actually know him. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be a game changer. In Acts, and we know this because in Acts 26, which we haven't come to, in verse 10, it actually says that Paul had a vote. And this is why we know that he was actually a member of the Sanhedrin. He wasn't just a supporter, he was actually a member. He had a voting right. So, of course, Paul, with a voting right in the Sanhedrin, would have thought fairly logically and said, Oh, I've got a good chance here. I was a former member, I have a vote. And so, in other words, he has a say in front of the Sanhedrin. But God reveals a plan to Paul at his conversion. Paul was a chosen vessel to bear whose name? The name of? Jesus, Jesus before whom? The, the Gentiles, kings and children of Israel, as we see here. It says for in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 to 16, it says that Paul is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And so here he is before this council. He's been before the Roman commander. He's going to get taken to Rome. He's been before Jews. He's been before the Gentiles. And so Jesus is saying that he must suffer for his name's sake. So Paul knows the general plan, but just like most of us, what does he do? He tries to work it out in his own strength. This is what I have planned for you. This is how I want you to do it. This is where I want you to go. And you go, thanks, Lord. All right, I'll take that information. And then I'll design it for myself and work out how I'm going to do it. And so Paul does exactly the same. So the message in this, of course, is that he should have been trusting God and the message for us is that we need to trust God as well and that's the role of us as believers.